Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. It's time for Twitch this week in computer hardware, episode number 72 for June 4th, 2010. The Magic Cauliflower is back. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by the new Carbonite Pro. It's simple, secure, and affordable online backup for your small business. For a free trial and to learn more, visit carbonitepro.com. And by audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash twitch. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware. I'm Ryan Shrout, and we have uh, Patrick Norton with us as always. How are you doing, Patrick? Good, man. And yourself? I'm, uh, I'm, I'm tired. I'm still waking up. It's early here in Taiwan. It's just about 9, 9.30 or so. But we have a special guest. Uh, I don't know if a lot of our people, a lot of our audience will know who he is, but he's uh, got some expertise <laughs> in the field. He's been around for a while. <laughs> I, just, uh, I just have a microphone, and I'm not afraid to use it. <laughs> Leo, Leo, sitting in with us today. Hey, Ryan. Uh, hey, Patrick. Uh, Hi, Leo. I'm so excited. So, Ryan, you're in Taiwan right now. Yes, yes. It looks it's, fantastic. Uh, I mean, what a good picture and everything. No latency. Yeah. That like when everybody checks out of the hotel and you have the internet to yourself, sometimes it'll actually work. Uh, <laughs> actually, I had less trouble this year than I've had in the past uh, at the Hyatt down in downtown Taipei. Usually, I always complain about how high tech the city is and all the stuff that is built here. And you can't find reliable internet connection, but uh, they seem to have done pretty well this time. So we went through the whole show yesterday without any disconnections. Is it your experience that the bandwidth is better in Taiwan? I know in Japan it's better, right? It is not better here. I was in Japan. I went to Japan a few days before I came here. Actually, I'd never been to Tokyo, mm. uh, and I went there. And my in my hotel, I was getting like twelve megs down <laughs> and ten megs up, or oh, something man. like that. Oh man! Um, so that was nice. Here, not so much. Maybe you know two down. One up oh, type of thing, but more than enough to do this. So, so how's it been at uh, Computex? Uh, it's been pretty good. It's been uh, fairly busy. There are a lot of announcements we were talking about before the show, uh, where Steve said something about forty-five tablet announcements. That's obviously Steve kind Gibson, of not Steve Jobs, by the way. Feature <laughs> the killer uh, product <laughs> to be discussing at the show. Everybody is everybody doing an iPad clone? Uh oh. Just <laughs> look at that. As soon as we said how good the service was, boom. Boom. Yeah, yeah Steve Gibson, I was asking Steve Gibson, he's watching Computex, and he said that the huge number of pad announcements, slate announcements, and he and I kind of agree that uh, while the iPad is an... Are you an iPad user, Patrick? The person whom I, you're trying to reach is currently on a... What a surprise. <laughs> that doesn't surprise I, I me. I am a, I, I am a, I am a, I am an iPad I, I own an iPad. I'm happy. I'm with so it. surprised I'm to hear you say that. So, so you like it? Yeah, it, it's it's you know I paid too much for it. It's a toy, um, but it's a phenomenal. You know, Seamus loves using it. He can interact yeah. with it. I watch movies on it, uh, and with a couple of tweaks, uh, I'm actually getting to the point where I can use. I can run all of the the Revision Three uh, software I need. The software we use at Revision Three to produce Texilla and this and G Nation. is the software you need. We rule, my friend. <laughs> You need yeah. a farm. Isn't that the the game that Veronica keeps playing on yes. her eyes and then screaming when it it it, yes. it stops running in the middle of some important corn? Yes, trans yes. Something? <laughs> Nothing worse than trying to harvest your corn when the when the internet or the the the, the, like a, the servers the plus servers are terrible. <laughs> I just say that was about the most ironic uh, thing to happen to me in a long. Yeah, time. isn't that funny? Losing your connection, Ryan's back. <laughs> As soon as he says how good it is, he's frozen solid. Yeah. Um, but I guess let's go ahead and jump into some of the hardware news over the past uh, couple of weeks because uh, I think we, we missed a week last week due to some other traveling. I think I was on my way to Japan when all that In happened. Flight. So In what's flight. the story with the Core i7-875K and the Core i5-655K? And what exactly are they talking about unlocked on those? Are they so an, un an unlocked processor refers to the multipliers that you can adjust for overclocking. So it's clock locking so, we're talking about. 
Right. Yeah. So usually, what you uh, cannot do on a on a retail processor is increase the multiplier on a, on a CPU. So if the base speed is 133 megahertz as it is on the Core i5 and i7 parts, then they apply a multiplier to it like 20, and all of a sudden you're running at 2.6 gigahertz. What you used to be able to do for overclocking is you'd be able to increase that front side bus or not the front side bus, but the bus speed, lower the mm -hmm. multipliers in order to get higher total clock speeds. With the K series that Intel's introduced with these two parts, they are unlocked from hmm. the factory, which means you can actually increase the multipliers up. Is that because they want to curry favor with the overclockers? Are there even any uh, overclockers left? That's the only reason to do this. That's the only reason to make these parts and to sell. How funny. Is to, can they charge uh, more for uh, it? They charge a little bit more, but what's <laughs> interesting is they've had, Intel's had an unlocked processor for a long time, but it's always been the extreme edition, right. $1,000 plus part. Right, and so these sell for I think uh, the 655k is like $220, and the 875k will be like $340. So these are much lower price for unlocked parts, and this is what the extreme, you know, those extreme overclockers, those people that want to do heavy overclocking, are obviously going to yeah. want these parts. To me, what I found was uh, I had a lot of good results overclocking the 655k. I think I got it. I got it up to 4.8 gigahertz. On wow. pretty Water cooling basic or air cooling? Air, no, air cooling with like a thermal take orb air cooler, mm -hmm. you know, a 40 or $50 air cooler. And I didn't have to, you know, push voltages. I think it pushed it to like 1.45, which is high, but not super high. Mm -hmm. And all this was done using the turbo mode multipliers. So turbo mode is the feature that Intel's processors will kind of automatically overclock when uh, based on workload and that kind of thing. So the benefit of that was it was only running at 4.8 gigahertz when I was actually doing something. When the computer was idle, it was running at you know, 1.2 gigahertz, you know, the dial, yeah, the dialed down speed. So you didn't get constant power consumption issues. But if I was, you know, when we ran our encoding tests for, you know, video transcoding tests, mm -hmm. it went up to 4.8 gigahertz, ran through everything real nice and fast. And then slowed back down. Whereas usually, when you'd overclock before, if you overclocked to 4.5 gigahertz, it was there the whole time. So your system was constantly running at that overheated, overvoltaged state. Whereas with these, you don't have to do that. You you mentioned the 655K, which is Core i5 part being particularly mm -hmm. overclocking friendly. What about the uh, the 875K, the Core i7 part? Was it you know happier than the 920 to overclock or? I I felt it was I I wasn't as impressed with that one. I kind of thought it was the same. I got 4.3 gigahertz out of it, uh, but you got to remember the so the Core i7 part is a quad core hyper threaded part. The, the Core i5 655K is a dual core hyper threaded part. So there's a little bit, and it's also a 32 nanometer processor as opposed to 45 nanometer processor. So they're they're fairly different chips as far as the architecture and the design and the process technology goes. So it didn't really surprise me that the dual core went further you know i mean it was has half as many cores a lot less heat to, to deal with and that kind of stuff and on a better process tech so but i mean overall for 215 dollars it was it's a it's a great processor if you're willing to you know do the overclocking for it right. if you're not going to overclock don't spend the extra money but i mean it's you're talking maybe 30 dollar price premium over like the standard cpu of a similar performance level at uh, at its base frequencies so is this, I mean, is this Intel trying to just beat on AMD in the Phenom processor, or is it just some corner of the market they felt they didn't have a good part is, for? So the Phenom's a real overclockable part, is that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They, the AMD has these Black Edition processors that they've been marketing for like two years, and Black Edition processors are unlocked. And you can get some pretty cheap unlocked parts. And so a lot of these extreme overclockers that are just trying to get world records and this type of stuff are just set, you know, frequency highs and that kind of thing. They were using these AMD parts because they were unlocked and they could, you know, if they burned one up, caught one on fire, whatever you want to do, <laughs> it didn't cost them a lot of money, right? It was a hundred bucks, $150. You can get some of those unlocked AMD parts for. So Intel, I think definitely felt like it's not going to cost them any more money really to do this. There's not, it's not a huge market that's doing this. Um, they're but not, it's nice to have to the world's work. fastest processor or make themselves a little more likely. That, for that's got to be it, right? It's it's because yeah. it, I mean it can't be a very big market. Who I mean, how many overclockers could there possibly be? But right. but but you get attention <laughs> when you say, oh look, the you know the Intel uh, Extreme was able to go to four point five eight gigahertz, 
that's good PR, right? I mean, what else yes. could they, what other reason could they? It's, it, I mean, it really, it's probably, you're right, because a lot of the highest overclocked existing parts are AMD parts right now. Right. That's so, got to, that's got to hurt them. You know, so they, they dominate in every other market and field really. And so they're like, well, all right, let's take a little bit of this too. So, but Hey, for, for a normal consumer, if you, if you're not the extreme overclocker, it's, it's just nice to have more options that way. So mm -hmm. I guess, I guess <laughs> some I of guess. us still overclock Leo. Really? Yeah. <laughs> it just seems so, uh, I don't know. Screensavers. I overclocked my uh, Palm Pre, so, you know. Well, no, I did. Yeah, people overclock their phones. I know that. And of course, if you want bad battery life, that's a great way to <laughs> kill your battery. But I was going to say, it, are you saying I'm 20th century, not 21st yeah, century? Yeah, it just Leo? seems like it's, I mean, uh, it's like, why, why? It's it's all about, it's like souping up a car now, right? I mean, it's all. I heard a good analogy of like that. It was, it was uh, like taking the engine out of your car and seeing how high you can tack it. Right. It's a very right. niche audience. Used to be you do it because you want to stick it to the man. You know, you get a <laughs> right. you get a 600 megahertz processor and get it to 750 with like those old Celerons. But that's right. But come on, <laughs> nobody nowadays. You're buying a 2.66 gigahertz part. You don't need to overclock it. Absolutely. If you want, you know, if you, the more video you render and the and the more disks you encode, the more you want a faster CPU. I bought a 920. I overclocked it faster. I, I bought a 250 $300 part, overclocked it till it was running faster than the $1,000 part. That made me happy. Yeah, but I'm telling you, I'm it's all... I'm still sticking it to the man, You're sticking Leo. it to the man because... <laughs> I haven't sold out like you... What does it do for reliability? What does it you know do for the light... It, it's amazing. If you if you put a decent... Uh, even air coolers now, a $50 air cooler... Uh, there's some fin just fantastic right. air coolers now. If you're water cooling, it's almost impossible to overheat the thing. All right, maybe, 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 maybe there is a. I mean, do you even still own a PC, Leo? Uh, like a desktop? No, <laughs> I actually don't. I mean, well, I own well. I mean, technically, we have PCs all over the place. But have, have I mean, you, do have you like one I use? No, I use yeah. laptops. Yeah. I use yeah. laptops, so uh, you're right. Mm -hmm. You're right. You know. You're ripping mm -hmm. through 400 Blu-rays to install them on your home <laughs> server. But we, you, you know, know, I don't think we, you know, we do all our rendering with uh, with Macs, of course. But uh, mm -hmm. I mean, we just buy faster Macs. Right. Like it's expensive. Yeah. <laughs> it tell me about it. It does. it does. You know what really kills me? I had to buy a Mac Pro. We brought a Mac Pro for our third editor last week. And, you know, we were trying to wait till the Extreme came out with the six processors. And we just gave up waiting for Apple. And guess what? Of course, I'm sure next week they'll announce it. Well, we thank you for that, Leo. Yeah, that's, I know they're that's waiting. The trend we like to see, right? <laughs> it just pisses me off. I mean, you buy something and then we get the benefits. But they, but Apple's been so slow getting these extremes into uh, the Mac Pros. You would think. I mean, they're out, right? The PC that's makers are the, using the them, right? Desktop oh, is yeah. dead, Leo. It's all the about six the, core? the tablet now. So there are plenty of PCs with a six core. Oh yeah. yeah oh yeah. Six course. core's been out since. Yeah, October, November, yeah, like, something like keep, that. Used to be Apple would be like the first with a new Intel chip, and they'd be quick out. You're right. You're you hit on the nail on the head, Patrick. They don't. They they, don't, they want. They're going to sell more of these little things. These little pad <laughs> higher things. margin. Yeah, <laughs> probably. I mean, uh, the, another component I, release oops, that uh, happened last week was a new Fermi. new graphics card release, GeForce GTX 465. There's not a whole lot different here, other than it's slightly slower part, slightly lower price, two hundred seventy nine dollars. It's uh, the first, it's the lowest priced DirectX 11 capable graphics card from NVIDIA. So that's mm -hmm. kind of important. It does put it on a, on kind of a price performance uh, balance with AMD at this point. The, it, it performs fairly close to the Radeon 5850, which mm -hmm. is priced at the exact same, same limit. Now these cards are still hotter. They're still going to consume more power than the AMD parts. So there's still disadvantages there. You can only run two monitors on them instead of three, which is a feature that I think a lot of people are deciding is, is kind of cool to do. Um, but it, it's important for NVIDIA because they're getting kind of hammered in the media and in the market in terms of having parts that are not as efficient, not nearly as as a, as a power efficient, not nearly as performance efficient, and uh, they're I, I think they're they're having problems making these parts as well, getting them to as high of clock speeds as they need to, and uh, with with good yields. So selling, creating a part like the 465 allows them to sell more of those chips that perhaps would not have otherwise been able to have been sold. They would have been tossed out or melted down or whatever they do with with bad uh, bad processor mm -hmm. dies. Ryan so, has created um, a new metric, which is bangs uh, dollars per CUDA core. 
And oh, right, yes. So the 480 is a dollar three per CUDA core. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The 470 is 77 cents per CUDA core. <laughs> what is what is the 465? What is the cost per CUDA core? It's about the same, like 79 cents or something like that. And CUDA cores, I should say, are the is what NVIDIA calls the shader units inside their CUDA. CPU, right. And so the more of those you have, the faster your GPU is going to go, the faster your game is going to go, the faster whatever GPU-based applications you have are going to go. I mean, there's a lot. I mean, the 470 has 448 cores. That's a lot. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, the, and the 480 has 480. It's Actually, amazing. but if you look at it's it's a it's a dance that the AMD and Nvidia go through because if you look at the t current high end part that uh, the AMD has, it's 1600 stream processors <sighs> in a single GPU. But it's all but those. I mean, they're not they're not directly comparable to each other. They they perform different uh, you know numbers of math operations per second and things like that. So it's not. It's not you really can't compare them across platform, but it's not merely that it has more cores or more multiprocessors. It's all it's other it's other things. There's lots of stuff that goes into it. Yeah. It's only really useful for comparing uh, cards that are in the same family, right? Uh -huh. So you, I, you know, it's it's interesting. You look at the GTX 470 to the GTX 465. It has 25 percent fewer shader processors, 25 percent smaller memory bus. And the performance is about twenty five percent less. Is there so one number? I mean, that you could say this this is a way of comparing apples to oranges. Between what Nvidia and AMD? Well, any of them. Uh, is it the, is it gigatexels per second or no? No, no, none of that. None of that really matters. And that's why we have to spend so much time doing do actual real world frame game rate. testing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because at the end of the day, there's a big software component to it as well. Right. So it's whichever team, NVIDIA or AMD, is making the best drivers for whatever games you're playing that comes into just as much uh, the story as the hardware itself. So GTX 465 is out. It's a good card if you're looking for DX11 part 279. Uh, check it out. More news from Computex coming up. Plus, uh, PC Magazine is rated the fastest mobile networks in the country. Which What, what do you have? A fast one or a slow one? We'll talk about that in just a second. Ryan Shrout is on the line from Taipei, where he is at Computex 2010. Patrick Norton is on the line from his kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Leo Laporte. We'll be right back. But I want to tell you a little bit about Carbonite Pro. Carbonite, the great backup service we talk about all the time on the network, on the radio show, too. It, you know, it's such a cool service. It allows you to back up automatically all your precious files for one low flat fee, less than five bucks a month, to the cloud where it's secure, it's safe, and can be retrieved at any time by any computer that can get online. Well, it turned out so many people liked Carbonite, the consumer version, they started to use it in business because there really isn't a great affordable solution for business. So Carbonite said, man, maybe we got to do something about that. And they created Carbonite Pro, C-A-R-B-O-N-I-T-E Pro.com. It's the same idea. You install Carbonite Pro on your desktops, all your users, as many users as you want. You have a central dashboard that keeps track of who's backed up, who's not. Your individual users can restore if you, if you let them, which is a nice feature. I always hated, Patrick, that walk down the hall at Tech TV. <laughs> uh, can you restore uh, my hard drive? I literally did something important. You can, <laughs> now, now your employees can do that themselves. Carbonite Pro, you could try it free for 30 days right now. Go to CarbonitePro.com. That's all you have to do. Uh, they're, they're really good about on this site. You know, they send you emails. They say, are you using it? Here's how it works. And they set it all up. Uh, price is very affordable. It starts as low as $10 per month for your business. I'll give you some examples. Um, eight computers, five gigs, 25 bucks a month. 18 computers, five gigs, 50 bucks a month. Very affordable and, and, frankly, a lot less expensive than buying Carbonite, you know, the consumer version for each user. Plus all the, you know, nice centralized features make it very simple. Good for business. CarbonitePro.com. Give it a try. We take you back to Taiwan, where Ryan Shrout is having breakfast. I did. I did. It was good breakfast, actually. What you um, have? Uh, we had, let's see, I had an omelet and some uh, some salmon, <laughs> cream cheese, onions. That was all, it was very good. So uh, you, uh, we were talking about bandwidth in Taiwan versus bandwidth yeah. in Japan. PC Magazine has decided to, I think this is a really good, only PC Magazine can do this stuff. This is where, where ZD and PC really exceed, excel, I think. Because uh, you need a big yeah. magazine to do these kinds of tests. You need lots of people in various locations across the, the country. Yeah. So, uh 
Did they say, did, is, there a, is there a clear-cut winner? Is there like one network that's the best? Well, Patrick, you were the one that, that pointed us to the, uh, to the article here. I was looking through it. I guess it depends where you are. I mean, national AT&T is the best. Right. But they did like Northeast, Southeast, Central. It looks to me that AT&T is more consistently ahead of everybody else, which I think is something that we had heard and, and talked about. This surprises know, me, though. That they have the fastest network, but having the fastest they claim that. they have the best. They claim that. Right. And, and uh, uh, you know, PC Magazine's rating them for consistency, download speed, upload speed, time to mm. first bite, all of which are, you know, very... And then, uh, this is weird, Patrick. I always thought Verizon was the best in New York City. Did you see T-Mobile has the best 3G? In, well, they have HSPA Plus in New York City. Patrick, are you there? Oh, he's Wait, muted. No, I, he's I, muted. I, I had the mute on. I, I kept trying to say something. You guys kept ignoring me. <laughs> We're ignoring like, you, Patrick. <laughs> just like the old <laughs> days, isn't it? <laughs> well, here's the thing, right? Uh, Sasha Sagan is does all the mobile testing for PC mag. Um, he, he, is, he knows more about mobile phones and mobile phone networks than anybody I've ever seen. And one of the interesting things about uh, the mobile networks is depending on when a particular organization got into the market, it really dictated the quality of their cell sites and the quality of the bandwidth they had. So what you're looking at right there they looked at six networks. They did a thousand rounds of tests in 20 cities, uh, pretty much from like Boise to Miami, New York to San Francisco. And like you guys were saying, AT&T consistently had the fastest network. They did not consistently have the most consistent network um, to, to use mm, kind of an I see what you mean. structure. So, <laughs> you know, yeah, in, in one of my, you know, one of my English major -y pain moments there. So what they did is they, they broke down it by city, by, by region of the country. Country. And it's actually, it's a pretty good list of networks, AT&T, Cricket, T-Mobile, Verizon Wireless, Sprint 3G, and Sprint 4G. And they basically had people go to different areas in each city to run multiple rounds of tests. And AT&T was the fastest, but the most consistent, I want to say, uh, looks like it might have been Sprint. I could be wrong. I haven't, I haven't read, I haven't analyzed all the numbers. But, you know, if you look at like national, yeah, it is national, sorry. PC Mag, the mobile speed index, AT&T was 93. The consistency was 86. Sprint 3G was like, you know, their speed index was 76. Uh, but their average around the country was like 95.9. Um, and their, the metrics they put together are basically looking at the, the download speed, the upload speed, uh, and how consistent they were across different locations around the United States. And AT&T and Verizon really have an advantage in this in terms of their networks and having some of the best bandwidth. AT&T, of course, owning the bandwidth but haven't, hasn't rolled it out in all of their markets yet. Um, Doesn't this surprise you? Because it seems so contrary to our own experience. <laughs> Well, That's what gets me. I mean, uh, if you ask anybody who's the fastest, most consistent network, they're going to say Verizon no matter where. Part of, and part and of Verizon comes out low in every one of these tests. They're one of the worst. See, if you ask me, I'd say Sprint because I've owned I've owned Sprint. Mm -hmm. um, You've always liked Sprint, I know. Yeah. Sprint, yeah. Sprint, Sprint's performance has been great, and it's always been very consistent for me no matter what hotel, city, side of the road, highway I was. Um, I just upgraded the Sprint Overdrive, uh, even though 4G is not available in San Francisco yet because it – a would allow me to connect my iPad to the internet without having to, to wait for an iPad 3G and pay another 30 bucks a month to AT&T. And B brings GPS, uh, a GPS sensor to the to the non-GPS 3G uh, iPad. But what's mm. interesting about the device is it's it basically supports 3G. It also supports 4G. What 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 PC Mag is looking at here is primarily data access. Um, and so they weren't looking at call drops. They weren't looking at sort of call quality. They're purely looking at data and data access speeds. Um, you know, Sprint's kind of interesting because they're they're doing WiMAX right now. Um, essentially, their 4G is WiMAX, not not their 3G technology. But it's not um, WiMAX in every market. Somebody told me, even though we were using 4G in, in Las Vegas, it wasn't WiMAX. Well, it depends on uh, so depends on which 4G we're. 4G I was using Sprint spec. 4G Clear in Las Vegas, and somebody said. It's not WiMAX in Las Vegas. Well, but is that 4G, wrong? 4G is not a wrong. spec. Okay. 4G is not a technology. 4G has become the blanket term right. for Next everything generation. that is supposed to be faster than right. 3G. Right. So there's a half right. dozen different technologies that kind of fall under the 4G blanket. Yeah, there's LTE and there's uh, clear wires using WiMAX. WiMAX, and, yep. you know. Clear wire, which like, is basically owned by uh, Sprint. Um, you know, I, I just found out that Craig McCaw 
is Clearwire. Here's a guy, really, we should lionize. I mean, he created Oops. cell networks in the U.S. He mm. was one of the first guys, Cellular One and all that. And he's con he has just gone on, and now he's doing uh, Clearwire. He's kind of an amazing guy. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. I, I thought uh, what was interesting about this is that the Sprint 4G network wasn't that much faster in a lot of cases than, say, the AT&T That network. was our experience. I'm sure Colleen has mentioned that, but in Vegas it was yeah. not. Now, the maximums were higher. And what's interesting in this is I was doing some tests on the I have the iPad 3G and I was doing some of the AT&T tests and I got some tests uh, that were, you know, like three, 3.5 megabits per second that, you know, are a little bit higher than some of the maxes they saw here. Uh, and I was getting very reliable speed. Maybe it's because, you know, in the Cincinnati area, it's not exactly a technology. How do we account yeah. for the fact that the reputation of AT&T is so bad? Is it because of their phone iPhone. It's got to be their drop calls. That's why. That's my life. Well, that's part favorite. of it. But I think the iPhone also may not give you the best performance. I wouldn't be surprised. Every every major every major carrier, whether we're talking or ISP, every ISP, whether you're talking about you know DSL, cable modem, you know wireless, um, you know Wi-Fi, basically everybody has packet shaping in place on their right. network, right? Um, especially the the cable companies and certainly the the wireless companies. I wouldn't be surprised if if the three G that that goes to the iPhone was heavily packet shaped. Maybe. I wouldn't be surprised. Maybe. You know, there's also a question of, of density, um, you know, uh, in terms of like population density, the, the number of phones accessing a particular tower at a time. Um, it's, it's amazing to realize how crazy all of this gets, how quickly. And also the, the general consensus that AT&T has not kept up particularly well with with. 3G demand, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if I wouldn't be surprised if maybe they kept a little bandwidth to the side for their data subscribers that are actually using a, a, a device to connect to their, you know, PC or MacBook um, that they, you know, don't right. maybe give the the 3G phones access to. What I mean, was it? What uh, what testing uh, methodology was uh, used in this? They have developed their own testing methodology and software. Um, mm. and I am not particularly familiar with that. So it wasn't uh, with a phone. No, they were using, um, they, they were using, uh, yeah, they were using, uh, devices that attach to computers. I'm trying to find right. the exact, uh, hold on. Let me, let me right. pull up uh, the how we test it. It's, it's sufficient. Yeah. It's sufficient. Yeah. We're running out of time. It's sufficient to know that it wasn't a phone or any particular phone. Yeah. Right. So if yeah, there is a difference between one handset and another, it wouldn't be reflected in these numbers. Now they use the same two notebooks with basically the the mobile mo the modems that are sold oh, by okay. the individual carriers. Okay. And they basically shipped the same notebooks all around the country to oh. the different testers That's since they were using the exact same hardware. It's not hardware, but do you do you feel betrayed by AT and T changing it to its tiered pricing? I guess this was inevitable. Um, you know, it's funny. Um. Uh, Dylan Tweeney over at Wired.com did a really – I hadn't read it before. He did an amazing article uh, uh, earlier this year when a lot of the net neutrality fura was going around. And he's basically saying, look, net neutrality is a great concept, but here's all of the negative impacts it's going to have on broadband and wireless broadband in the United States. And I think he was probably spot on. Um, the, general consensus, the general consensus I've seen from a lot of, of – of industry observers is that it was inevitable given the demand with smartphones that there would be some kind of per byte charge coming on wireless uh, devices. Um, if you look at Cisco just did their annual, you know, the state of the video moving on to the internet report that they've done for the last few <laughs> years. And they're talking about in four years, something like quadruple the video traffic, but like video traffic is already the 90% of the, or, or in four, I think in four years, 90% of the traffic on the internet is going to be video traffic. 90% um, of all traffic on the internet on an average by, day. By bit. By, in terms of because bit, it's so yeah. heavy, yeah, mm. because it's so heavy, because the files are so big, because we're all going HD. Um, you know, certainly the the ISPs and and you know I have I you know AT and T you know they're a for profit company. They've right. they've demonstrated that again and again. These are the people who are arguing that no 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 no. See, we can't give you the bandwidth you think you're paying for every second of the day, 24 hours a day. We'll give you it in bursts. 
You know, right. you can download a web page. It's 15 kilobits, but a four gigabyte file? No, 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 no. You know, um, and and they're you know they had their 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 you know technical economists do this amazing white paper justifying how if we actually gave you the bandwidth you think you're paying for every second of the day, every day of the year, it would cost you $475 a month to get a commercial account that would deliver that bandwidth to your home. Right? You'll have to uh, forgive me because these are the same companies who charge $1,500 a megabyte for SMS messages. Yeah, no, <laughs> so kidding. they've kind of lost any credibility with me. I don't, I mean, there may be, this may be true and it may not be true. Uh, yeah, I'm 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 firmly on your side on on this one, but yeah. but the you know the reality is I think you know the FCC's done some interesting studies. You can take the 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 I, certainly I would take anything coming from AT and T or Comcast. Right. Here's the opportunity. Block. Here's the opportunity. <laughs> there are two companies uh, who are kind of also rants at this point. You got Verizon and AT and T duking it out at the top. Uh, right. Sprint with his Evo, I think, is going to start doing well. But they're they're kind of an also ran, and T-Mobile's really kind of down at the bottom. Mm -hmm. If T-Mobile doesn't tier, if one of them doesn't tier, they have a real opportunity to grab market share, right? If they can well, figure out a way to do it, I would say yes. Because isn't everybody going to tier? Here, here, I think everybody's going to tier. But what happened is Sprint held out as, as with uncapped wireless uh, modems for longer than anybody else did. Right. right. That's one of the one of the they they had great speed. They had an awesome network coverage, and they also had no cap on uh, wireless data plans. So that is that is the third reason I went with Sprint. Finally, right. I want to say at the end of '98 or end of '98, end of 2008, um, they, <laughs> I think that was when they 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 put the same five gigabyte cap right. on that everybody else does. And I'm not sure why I'm talking with my hands today. I'm not sure what that's about. <laughs> but part of the reason they did that, you know, or, or one of the theories around why they did that is because they didn't have a cap. Everybody who was getting beat on for blowing through the cap on the other networks oh, came to the They got network. all the hogs. That's what they right. got. I get it. You know, and every <laughs> time you read one of these, every time you read anything from any of the, the providers, whether it's Comcast for cable modem or one of the wireless providers like AT&T, they always say it's it's 2% of, of right. our subscribers that actually use more than this cap. And what they don't say is that 2% is the leading edge, right? Because 250 gigabytes sounds like a huge amount of data. Right. I've got 250 gigabytes. I can download every month until you realize that a mediocre quality HD movie off of iTunes is typically four gigabytes. My 80-year-old father-in-law, who I gave an iPad to a week ago, sent me an email five days later, said I went through all 250 megabytes. I guess I'm going to have to get the unlimited. <laughs> so it's not just leading, bleeding edge. But you're right. Any company yeah. that dares to not tier, to have uh, either unlimited or to not uh, you know, uh, do this tiering that, ever, that AT&T has launched... Is going to get all the bandwidth hogs yeah. and is going to put well, the, themselves the, out of business. The 250 megabyte cap is, especially on the iPad, it's is ridiculous. a complete MacGuffin. It's a joke. It's unusable. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, because what a lot of people don't realize, I don't know if it was in Gadget or Gizmodo, one of the websites basically traced the exact amount of data that doing a Facebook page, like checking your Facebook page three times or there you go. checking You're four done. Twitter accounts. Wow. Like, a, like a Facebook page was like a megabyte and a half or four megabytes. Well, that explains it because wow. he wrote me, he said, well, how could I have gone through 250 megabytes? And I said, I don't know what you've been doing. Well, but literally it turned out it was like, Facebook. I think it was... Yeah, checking Facebook four times with seven megabytes or some insane number yeah. like that because it recaches everything. It's, 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 right. it's on the yep, page, no right? On it. yeah. I stopped doing yeah. the speed test because the speed test I was using on the iPad did 10 megabytes each time. Yeah. <laughs> I thought, well, I'm not going to be able to do very many of those. Hey, we got a lot of news, and I uh, have another ad. And, Patrick, you've got to go do forecast. Why don't, yeah. Ryan, why don't we run through some of the uh, headlines from uh, Computex right now, some of the, some okay. of the, some of the stories. So I think, I think obviously, uh, we need to touch uh, on the world of, of – Slate and pad, e pads, oh, hell, and, uh, whatever you want to call them. So, tons of these were announced. The SUS was probably the most prominent one here, probably because they're one of the largest Taiwanese technology companies. Uh, they announced two different models. I can't remember the model numbers, but it mentioned a 12 inch tablet. The 10 inch tablet uses the NVIDIA Tegra 2 chip and uses a Windows 7 CE embedded operating hmm. system. Hmm. And so, then you have your their own kind of ASUS branded and built kind of software layer on top of things, uh, which I have to say, you know, I, I got some hands-on time with it, and it wasn't that great yet. Right? It, it, it's, yes, a company it's like Asus cannot compete with a company like Apple at this level. When it comes to software, yeah, and that's, and that's what I was it's crazy. Know, trying to... I was going to say, is to, it a software it a issue, or is it a... Because the Tegra seems like a pretty solid... Oh, the hardware's there. Set. The hardware's yeah, the there. Hard, the hardware's fine. It's just... 
You got a, you got a, a software, a very very small company attempting to right. do the same. Although kind of HTC's Sense is a really nice UI on top of Android, yeah. I have to say, that's, so it's, it's possible. That there's, there's yeah, that there's hope there, and and these parts aren't going to be out until Q1 of next year, so they've got another six months to work on the software side of things. But you're right, I think the Tegra 2 platform provides enough power for you know to compete with what the iPad does and that kind of stuff. And well, then the full inch model. Microsoft, oh, sorry. I was going to say, no, supposedly Microsoft was, was running around with a Windows embedded Compact 7. And that actually, mm. from the from the couple shots I thought, it looked like a huge, I, I, I just, I, I keep thinking like Windows CE. I was like, oh, it's not dead yet. That's so sweet. But, uh, <laughs> you know, but an optimized version of Windows 7, because they have some decent multi-touch inside of Windows 7, that actually could be useful if they had... So, yeah, it's, it's called Microsoft Windows Embedded Compact 7. Another one of their great names for an operating system. But um, is, it kinda, is it kind of like a Zune-based operating system, like a mix of Zune and Ken operating systems, I guess? But Zune's good. From, from what I read, it's not they're not planning on actually producing this, right? It was just kind of a proof of concept for the software i guess but what you know, about maybe, android what just, isn't this i mean look you gotta have i think you gotta have a multi-touch mobile operating mm -hmm. system android's pretty polished yep. uh, aren't people doing I mean, there must have been a lot of android tablets there 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 were android tablets there but they weren't nearly as prominent like all mm -hmm. the ones that we saw were either using mm -hmm. windows 7 or windows 7 you know like windows ce is uh, embedded I mean, is what is embedded how is embedded different from the 7 is it Embedded is not an x86 operating system, so it's okay. not. It can't run traditional Windows applications. It's built for that hardware. Since so Tegra is an ARM-based processor with you know some NVIDIA GPU bits and that kind of stuff thrown in, it, it could not use your standard kind of Windows 7 or Windows 7 mobile uh, iteration. And, and embedded an is, system. I'm told, modular. Paul Thorat said it's modular, so they can plug in mm -hmm. stuff, yeah. which gives them the capability of mm -hmm. running on lighter or harder, or bigger hardware, depending on what they've got. Right. Right. The the twelve inch tablet that they were showing, uh, obviously bigger, but nice. it uses yeah. Intel CULV Core two CULV parts, uh, and was running Windows seven on it. So that one was kind of like it had much much faster hardware. They were still claiming to be able to get ten twelve hours battery life out of it uh, using you know the lowest voltage possible for a, a Core two processor. Um, Haven't we <clears> been there, done that, and? I, I kind of feel that way, yeah, yeah. I mean, at least seven has multi-touch and you know more touch touch built in. But we've seen Windows yeah. tablets, and they and they haven't, haven't really impressed. They haven't impressed. Oh, we've seen an Apple tablet too. It was just a long time ago. Yeah, the Newton. <laughs> yeah, they come. They've come a long way since then. So, but the the interesting thing to me was the hardware itself seemed very nice, very polished. Ah. Um, it was it was very you know not quite up to Apple build qualities yet. But again, we're still six months out from most of these. He's hitting the street, and they had connectivity. You know, they had headphone jacks and audio jacks, input jacks. They had USB ports, um, things like that. That maybe we have to admit could be useful on a tablet, even if you don't have to use them all the time. Um, so you know, they're still, they're still. I think you're right. Like the previous tablets, where it was just Windows on a tablet with a touch screen, and it didn't really work out that well. I think they're. They're trying harder to go towards what the iPad has done in terms of software and in terms of simplicity of hardware. But I feel like nobody wants to make that jump completely. Like mm -hmm. nobody wants, nobody, everybody's afraid to, in this, in this industry, to, to release a tablet without a USB port or release a tablet without, um, you know, kind of Windows base behind it or um, things like that. You know, even though we saw some of the Android models out there. So hmm. I'm really interested. I mean, I love Android. I've abandoned my iPhone mm -hmm. for Android. I'm really interested to see if an Android tablet can compete with the iPad. See, I, I still haven't. I haven't had an Android phone yet. So this HTC Evo 4G will be my gonna, first. I think you're going to like it. I, I really know do. I like my Palm Pre yeah. and the operating system on that. <laughs> and I know the whole HP Palm stuff we've talked about before and the possibilities there are pretty good. Have Obviously, they, nobody was talking nothing, about that. They're not, they didn't show anything there. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's too early. Yeah. Well, is it? Because wasn't the slate going to come out this year? I thought well, it was. I mean, the, 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 I think it's too early for the Palm. The Palm. Oh, WebOS to be integrated. You're right. Yeah. 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 I'd love to see that. WebOS would be a great choice as well. I'd be very happy to see WebOS on a tablet. I, I it's agree. my opinion that it's got to be a mobile operating system with multi-touch and, and, and designed around the idea that you're touching stuff yes. as opposed to, uh, you know, clicking stuff. 
emulating a mouse. Right. <laughs> yeah. And that's what Windows 7 yeah. is going to do, essentially, is emulate a right. mouse. I don't... The other, uh, the other major topic from Computex I figured I'd mention real quick is AMD showed their first Fusion APU. This is an APU stands for Accelerated Processing Unit. It's a term AMD basically invented for uh, the processor that's finally going to be the result of the AMD ATI merger. So this, this, these Fusion parts are traditional x86 processing architecture cores included on the same diode designed for the same chip as... GPU stream processors, this traditional what you see in a GPU. So they're basically combining the power of the CPU and GPU and putting it in one part. They're going to share a memory bus. They're going to share a whole lot of different components. And uh, this, they demonstrated it for the first time. And they're, they're way behind on what they should be, where they should be in terms of this design and, and the hardware for this. But uh, it, was, it was fairly impressive. They didn't give any specifics. They showed uh, the Ontario version, which is going to be uh, for aiming at like the Atom markets, netbooks, low-end notebooks, that type of thing. Running a DirectX 11 game, they didn't say at what resolution, but it looked pretty good. It was relatively smooth uh, on, on pretty early hardware. They have uh, a, a full-size notebook version that's going to include four x86 processing cores plus probably mm -hmm. like a Redwood style. Uh, think of Radeon performance around like a 5500 or a 5600 graphics card all in one chip. And so this wow. is obviously it's a big deal for the industry. It's a big deal for these OEMs and ODMs, um, and I think it's gonna it's gonna change the market that Patrick and I love so much, the DIY market, quite a bit, because essentially what AMD is hoping to do is is take any graphics card that you can buy for under a hundred dollars and make it irrelevant, because you could buy a CPU with that much power integrated into into the into the die. That so, would be nice. Yeah, it would be. It would be. But now you've got to be worried about whether or not that's going to completely kill the discrete graphics market uh, in order for it will drastically lower its, uh, you know, how much work they're willing to do for this small enthusiast base to get graphics cards up and running and that kind of stuff when they can just, they would much rather sell these integrated parts that are going to be higher margin, lower cost, better for the OEMs <clears throat> to integrate into their systems and that kind of stuff. But it's well, interesting from a technology perspective. I mean, I, I think I agree that it's interesting from a technology perspective, but, you know, the the performance and the heat for decent 3D gaming at this point, uh, I think is going to preclude the enthusiast market kind of getting, you know, walked away from at the high end or at least at the decent gaming level, like $200 and up. And also right. Intel can't seem to build a decent graphics card, um, you um, know, unless Larry Have they kind of given up on that, the, the discrete well, graphics? Well, they actually showed uh, – of their up, their next generation part called Sandy Bridge, and that mm -hmm. integrates CPU and GPU as well. But you're right, Intel doesn't have nearly the reputation for hot, you know, solid graphics uh, in in that market. I, but they they've kind of canceled the Larrabee project when it comes to like going to the world of discrete graphics. It would seem, and we saw a another brief brief demonstration of Sandy Bridge graphics performance, and it was again fairly good. I would say I would compare. The performances we saw on the first Fusion APU to what Intel's Sandy Bridge showed, but the difference mm -hmm. is, is the Fusion APU is like a netbook part, and the Sandy Bridge right. part is like a full-size desktop part. So there's still going to be some dramatic differences there. But I think Intel is, you know, over the last three to four years, they have understood what is going to happen. That they need to uh, focus as much on their traditional GPU stream, um, you know, just highly stream capable computing as opposed to just the sustainer processors as well. Um, that leaves NVIDIA kind of out on its own right now. And so what if I Intel think, buys NVIDIA? Then it would be great. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, that, that would be, I think that... And we've lost I Leo. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't think that's going to happen. I think that that's, you know, that, that, the, the window of opportunity for that went, went, came and went. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think, I think that, that offer was probably made five or six years ago. And from what I've heard, rumors around Taiwan and that kind of stuff is that the cultures of the two companies just clash so much that they wouldn't be able to do it. And you think yep. about it, NVIDIA is a very marketing-driven kind of, you know, pound the fist on the table type company, whereas Intel uh, does all that behind the scenes, right? They go out and, and plot your demise behind your back. Whereas <laughs> I have some friends who work at Intel. They, they always said there was a lot of screaming and pounding on tables. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, um, it's, it's just an interesting technological shift because we're, I mean, you're, you're going to be able to buy these parts for, you know, $300, $400, probably less than that. And 
get CPU, GPU all in one, and it's going to be, you know, think of what you can get today from a Radeon 5600 card or 5500 card, and you're going to get that performance in theory from one of these parts. So Got it potential. should be interesting. Yeah. We have questions. You have answers. We're going to get to those in just a second. If you're listening to This Week in Computer Hardware, Ryan Shroud is in Taipei, Taiwan, covering Computex 2010. Patrick Norton from techzilla.com is also here. But first, oh, hey, Patrick Norton, so techzilla.com. <laughs> He's so cute. <laughs> but first, <laughs> I want to talk about audible.com. Since I'm here, can I do the ad? Because, I mean, golly, I'm the Audible guy here. Audiblepodcast.com slash Twitch. You can go there right now. Your first book is free, and there's so many great choices. But look at this. Look at this. This is my Nexus One running the new Audible beta software. I'm so excited. Finally, our Audible books, you can listen to them uh, on your uh, Android phones. Now, this is beta. You have to go to Google Groups, groups.google.com, uh, and look for the Audible Android beta. But you see that? It's all the books in my library. I can download any one of them, listen to them. Oh, oh the screen went off. I have to, Yeah, there you go. And uh, and uh, you can you can it, has, it does all sorts of weird four square like badges for the most books listened to and stuff like that. They made the game. <laughs> this is something even the uh, iPhone doesn't have right now. The iPhone you just sync up with uh, iTunes and it just plays like an iTunes uh, thing. But this is this is a dedicated Android. Um, uh, I think we've confused John. <laughs> Give it to me. Give it to me. You never used Android, did you? This is a dedicated. Um, uh, app, which is kind of cool. You can, I don't think you can yet buy books on here, but it sure uh, is nice. So now I can safely say Android, uh, uh, Audible plays on almost everything, including Android phones. Of course, all the Apple devices, the Zune, the Kindle. And man, I tell you, if you are f taking a long flight across the Pacific or just a drive <laughs> uh, to work in the morning, having a great audiobook or two. Did you listen to audiobooks at all, Ryan, on your trip? I did. I did. So it's a 14 and a half hour flight from L.A., to Taipei, and it's about 12 and a half hours going back. Oh. So, yes. you got to have audiobooks. Yeah. What did you listen to? What do you like? Um, I'm a Star Wars nerd, so I was listening to uh, a new, the latest Star Wars novel that had come That's out. That's supposed to be pretty called. good. Was it good? Yeah, you know, I some of the first ones that came out were really, really, really good. They, they've kind of gotten a little stale recently, like they're trying to think of ideas for stories and that kind of thing still. Yeah. But it's like a continuation of the universe that star wars took place in so all the characters in there are growing up and have kids and have grandkids <laughs> and all this other kind of stuff it's it's kind of weird but it's just it's one of those books if one comes out every two or three months and i'm like all right i'll read that so. spoiler alert luke is darth vader's son <gasps> no just kidding so <laughs> before your next long journey i want you to go to audiblepodcast.com slash twitch and get a book free there's so many great choices there. Uh, you will love how they are read, too. They're not dry. They're really, they come alive uh, on your iPhone or your Android phone. It's just fantastic. Audiblepodcast.com slash Twitch. Patrick, when you get your Evo, I want you to put your, <laughs> your Audible software on there. You're going to love it. We've got questions. Ryan and Patrick, do you have answers? Try. Maybe. Tweet yeah. to Ryan Shroud on Twitter. It's at R-Y-A-N-S-H-R-O-U-T. That's what Zezix did. He said, yeah, hey, Ryan, buying a Vertex 2 120 gigabyte running Win 7, what tweaks are absolutely necessary and what tweaks are just recommended? So uh, my answer to this is none. Yeah. The Win Windows 7 implements trim. Vertex 2 drive supports trim. There are a lot of places and a lot of forums you can go to that will tell you, uh, well, if you partition the drive with a certain offset, it will improve performance <laughs> and all this other kind of stuff. And, and in truth, if those, if those even change anything, it, the differences are minute. Trim's the only thing that matters. Trim's Trim is the only thing that really matters. And now that we've got that uh, implemented, Windows 7 is out. What do you mean we, white man? Best. We, we Mac users don't. We Linux oh, well. users don't. It's just Windows 7. Hmm. Well, that's what you get for... That's what I get. Steve Jobs is, uh, <laughs> that's what I get. The big camera shot full of nothing is what you get. But yeah, I mean... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm, you know what? I'm a big Ubuntu uh, uh, Lucid Lynx fan. I love 10.04. It's just fantastic. Um, and I have it in a machine, my Samsung, a Samsung uh, NC20 that has an SSD in it. 
But of course, as uh, Alan told me, there's no no really get no benefit from the SSD in there anyway because it's not a SATA two bus. But I feel, it makes me feel yeah. bad that it, there's no trim. You support. still get you still get benefits of the of the of the quick access time. Absolutely. You still get extended bandwidth. Zero seat. I mean, yeah. And uh, and there's no you know the reason I put it in is because the NC twenty which is a little netbook, um, you could feel this hard drive spinning. You could feel the the momentum from the hard drive, and it just was weird holding a laptop <laughs> that had its own centripetal force. You know, it's like just, <laughs> it's a pretty <laughs> old school sensation. I mean, I'm actually running um, an SSD in in my work notebook right now under OS ten quite happily you yeah. know i also yeah. haven't filled it up to the point where it's starting to sort of back up and choke on things at which point you know there's there's you know you either you know wipe it and reinstall your, your will that do the same as trim again. i mean so what you can do um is if like you back up your if you image your drive to like an external drive and then image it back you're reset like because okay. basically it, it writes all data in one giant pass what what trim fixes is all the random things right. that get jumped up and, and that kind of stuff. But if you just, you read it all out and then you write the whole thing back to it, it should be uh, much improved again. It's kind of so. like disk optimization for SSDs. Yeah. <laughs> basically. Jason BNE tweets, Ryan Shrout, question for Twitch, is extra bucks for Core i7 9XX versus 8XX worth the extra speed or stuff? Thanks. Stuff. Is it worth the Stuff. money? How much more is a, is a 9, 900 series than an 800 series? It depends on which processor you go for. Yeah, is it a lot more? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, for I a $1,000 mean, processor? The most popular one's a 920 that, that Patrick no. uses. So yeah. That's so not the, the six core. The real difference comes in the platform, though. Oh. Going to I7 can... is, the, is the real benefit. Yeah, so, so well, yeah, Core i7 900 series uses a different socket than the Core i7 800 series. The, Core, the 800 series is Linfield part. The 900 series is the Bloomfield part. Bloomfield is the, the original Nehalem part that came out, triple channel memory, uh, 1366, I'm sorry, 13, yeah, 1366 LGA socket. So it's bigger. Usually those, those motherboards have uh, more PCI Express lanes on the board and that kind of stuff. And then the, the 800 series, it's Linfield, it's dual channel memory. It's a little bit different core. The chipset's a little bit lower end. So I mean, besides having to me, add RAM in three sticks versus two sticks, is there really a speed benefit to triple channel? Um, I mean, there are there are performance benefits to triple channel. Yeah, I mean, they're not dramatic. I would say somewhere in the order of five percent or something like that. Uh, you get a lot of people say that uh, Patrick is one of those guys that, that loves the Core i7 920 processor. Right, so I mean, it's, I do. it's known to be very overclockable. Uh, I know Colleen loves those. It's it's. It, it, I think it's relatively cheap now, 200, 200 bucks or something like that. I'm uh, actually checking on Newegg right now to to see what the updated prices are on that. Um, sorry, give me one second and I'll sort that out. I have an i. I, mean, I silly I, me. I bought an i7 Mac laptop, but is that silly? So it's i7, but it's it's still you know the dual core Linfield architecture or Clarkdale yeah. or Lin Linfield architecture. It's so a I mean, mobile it's, part it's too, right? I guess to answer his question, I would say probably not to me. Like I would use and I I built a core i7 860 part, right? So mm -hmm. we talked about this on the radio part. show. You, I mean, there's not that much difference in i5 and i7 except hyper threading, right? Right, right. Yeah. By and the way, Patrick, the, an answer from our chat room. There is a Android navigation program called copilot live that oh, does funny. Copilot live is a very funny application it's available on the the iphone os too yeah it's 30 bucks which is cheap for a uh, for a dedicated i guess it is uh, yeah navigation application. and it stores the maps on the uh, phone good to know oh the core i7 uh 860 linfield and the core i7 920 are both selling for 280 bucks now on new egg hmm. so okay Right. It's a so that's a go. wash. So you'll spend a little bit more on well, you might spend a little bit more on memory uh, and the motherboard right. going with the uh, going with the uh, the Bloomfield the 920 part. But I yep. mean, especially if you're if you it, it's it's a it's you know chances are if, if you're upgrading from anything that's more than a couple of years old, the performance boost is going to be so ridiculous. Much like going from any rotating hard drive at this point right. to an SSD, uh, the performance boost is going to be so ridiculous. You're you're not really gonna you know, miss that extra 5%, I would imagine. Yeah. Mussinger tweets, 
Recommendation for a video card that drives three monitors, preferably DVI or HDMI, less than $150, and quiet performance. Who cares? <laughs> Uh, I did. I did a real quick check. You can get the Radeon fifty six seventy graphics card uh, for under ninety dollars now. I think wow. I saw some for around eighty bucks. Those support three displays, and the Radeon five thousand series are the only cards out right now, kind of consumer cards that will run three displays. Um, what does it have? Two uh, two DVIs and a two, mini Display Port, or how does it? It has two DVIs and a Display Port. Display Port. Um, okay. And you have to have, or the like one of the XFXs I'm looking at has a. DVI and HDMI and a DisplayPort. Hmm. But the caveat is one of them has to be DisplayPort if you want to do three displays out of it. So hmm. that means you'll have to get, um, if, you're, if you're just doing 1080p resolution, you can just get a passive adapter to go from DisplayPort to HDMI or DVI or whatever it is you need. If you're doing larger screen like uh, 2560 by 1600, if you're doing 30 inch monitors or something like that, you have to get a much more expensive active adapter that will usually run you about $100, requires power and that kind of stuff, which is a little bit of a pain. Actually, it's a lot of a pain. Um, but the passive adapters work pretty well. So you can get three monitors for way under 150 bucks. Just look for anything in the 5000 series and check out the connectivity options there. And as long as it has one display port connection, you'll be able to do three displays. Cool. Yep. Next question from Daniel E. West. He tweets, do you think the onslaught of DLC for PC games will just nickel and dime PC gamers and hurt the industry or make it flourish? Uh-oh. What's DLC? Downloadable, downloadable content. content. Oh, yeah. They're talking about Steam. No? They're talking about no. in game downloadable content. They're talking about Modern Warfare 2, the new maps. What are they talking about? They're talking about that kind of stuff, exactly, is, is the idea of paying $5 for new maps for Halo right. or um, buying new missions in Mass Effect. That's good. That's good for business. Game. It's good for gamers. Paul Therott's a perfect example, like a lot of. Modern Warfare 2 guys, he got to 10th level prestige. He stopped playing until the new maps came out today. He's happy. Um, I, I think, I, I don't, I'm not a fan of it. Like, I don't like the idea. I, I do feel like I'm being nickeled and dimed all the time. But it's more um, content. It's more play, right? Some, like, a lot of people like to complain that, well, this is content that was in the game that they took out so they could charge you again no. for it later. And, you know, a lot of conspiracy theory and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, There's also a lot of people who, who basically spent two years playing a single Halo map or four or five Halo maps right. in, in, you know, <laughs> brutal onslaught mode. So they I'm feel still like, playing Quake 2. I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> well, you know what I mean? But it's like the whole idea that, like, you know, I have to be online to right. deal with insert name of annoying company's security process. Well, well, that I, uh, I mean, I think Ubisoft's yeah. done more to hurt PC gaming than anybody. Yeah, no doubt. And, <laughs> and I that, think that's all. This question, buy. it doesn't matter what I what we think about it because that's the way <laughs> it's, it's going, and that's the way it's going to keep going. Yeah. I and, mean, in terms of DLC and the and the, and the micro transactions is what they like to call it, right? It's only yeah, a I mean, dollar, right? But it's only a dollar fifty times a year, so that's how they get it. It's less than the game was originally, probably, right? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Though if they if they stripped down these games so that they you know you can only get ten hours of gameplay unless you bought the additional DLC, I would I could I could see that that would be a unhappy. But that's I don't think it don't, doesn't feel that way yet. No, I mean no, it, I, it I also think, depends I think on the reasonable. game too. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm the kind of idiot that buys stuff on Steam every week. So <laughs> have you paid for anything with your for your farm yet? Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's the same same idea. Yeah, right, so. I don't like that at all. But they took the magic cauliflower away, and I they they're so sneaky. <laughs> they're so sneaky. They got me hooked on the idea that I could level up fast and I could build and build. Then they took away the magic cauliflower, and I had to buy some mojo. But that's a story for another day. <laughs> Ryan Shroud, when are you coming home? Uh, I leave tonight, uh, and then I begin my 24-hour journey home. So I'll be, I'll be back for the weekend. I hope you have some good audible books to listen to. Yes, exactly. And Patrick Norton is seen on Texilla, T-E-K-Z-I-L-L-A dot com, and yes, Revision please. 3. <laughs> and uh, anything else you wants to plug, Patrick? Uh, HD Nation, the show I do with Robert Heron every week on uh, high-definition content and home theater equipment. Love that uh, stuff. HDNation.tv. You loving 3D, Patrick? 
Eh, not so much. Not me neither. Um, I think the, the the killer application for 3D on HDTV is sports. Uh, I, I know some some people who have seen football games and freaked uh, over what an amazing experience that was. And gaming, I think, has a lot of potential for 3D movies. Right. I'm not really feeling it, but maybe I'm too old school. Well, just watch HD Nation. You will find out. You will learn all. And if you guys don't mind, I'd like to come back once in a while because it's kind of fun doing this show, and I learn a lot. Yeah, oh. absolutely. We like having you there. And uh, just, network, be, like dude. you said, this will be your vacation <laughs> show, right? You don't have to run the board. I, d I don't. I let, sit there, eat I let right Jammer, before, I can, and I can manage my in. farm while you guys are talking. I, I just Somebody <laughs> said cauliflower's back. I, I'm looking to see. That's what had you distracted when we were talking about that. I was listening. <laughs> NVIDIA and ATI and all that stuff. There were some computers and stuff in there, right? Yeah. Stuff I was interested in. No, All right. that was a lie. There's no... Ma Wait a minute. Magic Cauliflower is back. Hoorah! That may be the name of the show. Magic Cauliflower. <laughs> <laughs> I'm using... I'm buying some mojo. The magic Cauliflower is back. <laughs> Gotta be it. It's back, <laughs> baby. <laughs> hey, thank you, Ryan. Hey, thank you, Patrick. We will see you soon. We'll see you next week. We do this yep. show actually live. Uh, they do this show. Who who we? They do this show live every uh, Wednesday at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Wait a minute. Shh. 6 plus 12 is 18 plus 7 is 0100 UTC the following day. How about that? <laughs> in your head calculations. See you next time on This Week in Computer Hardware. Bye -bye.